Happy Easter. How are we doing today? Yes, you may be seated at this moment. Hey, we want to welcome you here today. The sun is out. The birds are chirping. And Jesus is alive and well. Amen? Yes. Awesome. Well, whether you're a regular attender or a guest, I want to welcome you in the room. My name is Jansen Bounds. I have the great honor of serving as our preteen and four friends pastor here at Temple. Our preteen ministry is our fourth and fifth graders, and our four friends ministry is our ministry to people with special needs. Well, good morning. My name is Austin Baum, and I get to be the college pastor here at Temple Baptist Church. And look, truthfully and genuinely, we want to say thank you for choosing Temple Baptist Church to be your place of worship on this Easter morning at 7.30 in the morning. Come on, right? And look. So whether you're in the wings over here, whether you're on the floor, or whether you're up in the balcony or with us online, like we, we truly are thankful that you're here. And one thing we want you to know is what to expect this morning, what you can look forward to. Hey, in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate life change uh, through baptism. And we're going to continue and worship through song with our praise team and our choir and orchestra. Um, Pastor Dave is going to bring a brand new series this morning. Uh, he's starting a new series titled Vintage Values. And look, this is our hope. Our hope is that we all don't just hear part one of the series. Like, we want to invite you back to come next week and the weeks to come to hear the rest of this series. And so this morning, Pastor Dave is going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And so what are we going to see in Philippians chapter 2 this morning? We're going to see the gospel. We're going to see the gospel. And I was hesitant this morning to use that word gospel because I'm guilty in conversation and also on stage like this to use words that are kind of churchy that not everyone knows and not everyone grew up hearing. And so what is the gospel? Well, simply put, the gospel is the good news. Well, if you're like me, I ask a lot of questions. So what makes the gospel good news? What makes it good news? It's this, that the God of the universe demonstrated his power and love to all of humanity. How do you do that? Through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And through that, yeah, we clap, come on. And through that death and resurrection, he removed every obstacle between us and him so that we can have a relationship with him, so we can know the fullness of joy in him. And so this morning, we have a living hope. And I use that word living on purpose because if you think about it, when you think about your week and you think about the months that pass, there's all different things that we put hope in. Students that made it here at 7.30, like you're hoping as the school year comes to the end uh, to pass that class, right? Running out of time. For those of you in the room who, uh, fellows in the room, maybe you hope that she will text you back. I don't know. Some of you hope for a raise. Some of you hope to retire early. Most of us hope that the meatloaf that we bite into that our mother-in-law prepared this morning doesn't make us sick. There's a lot of hope. But... Not all of those hopes are living. A lot of those are just maybes. But this morning, we stand on a living hope through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Hope is the expectation of the promises of God that he's already given. And so, this morning, no matter where you are, take that step of faith and stand on the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ. So Jansen, tell them about what their next step might be. Come on, Austin, that's awesome. Hey, whether you're a regular attender or you're a guest in the room, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to grab one of those red connect cards in front of you. If you're on the front row, it's below you. And this is much more than us just receiving your information. This is a way, just like Austin said, for you to take a next step. And maybe that next step today is professing faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe your next step is following through with believer's baptism. Maybe your next step is plugging into the life of Temple Baptist Church. So I'm going to encourage you, whether you're in the room or online, to grab this Connect card, fill it out, and on your way out, drop it in one of those brown boxes so we can follow up with you and help you take that next step. If you are online, you can receive that same card by texting TBC Life to 94000. So please do that. We want to help you take that next step. So church, we get to worship this morning. It's going to be an incredible morning as we sing, we hear the gospel proclaimed. So as we continue to worship, I'm going to encourage you to turn your attention to the baptistry as we worship through believers' baptism. All right. Good morning and happy Easter. The tomb is empty 
and King Jesus reigns over sin and death this morning and for all eternity. And what better way to point us to what Jesus has done on the cross than through believers' baptism this morning. And so I have Carson Mackinder. He's involved in our middle school ministry. Good buddy of mine. He is the son of Kyle and Jenna Mackinder. And uh, Carson got saved when he was younger, but as he continued to grow and be involved in church, he just got very convicted about how he hasn't come before his faith family and told them and shown them that he is a believer of Jesus Christ and that he's placed his faith and trust in the gospel, the good news, as Austin just said. And so that's what he's here to do this morning. Look, baptism is something that we do to identify as believers in Jesus Christ. This water is just normal water out of a spigot. It's not special water. It doesn't save us. This act doesn't save us. It's only through trusting and believing in the hope of Christ Jesus that we are saved. But this is a powerful symbol to show you that he is a believer of Jesus Christ. And so Carson, I have a question. Who's your Lord? Jesus Christ. Amen. It's upon that profession of faith, it's a privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Good job, buddy. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we continue to worship together?
Savior. You're my Savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Sing that again.
Don't know how you did that this early in the morning, but kudos to you. Hey, we're glad that you are here today. If you are a first-time guest, maybe your first time in a long time, welcome to Temple Baptist Church. My name is David Witten. I have the great honor of being the senior pastor here. And so I just want to begin by saying happy Easter to everybody. And so if you have a copy of the scripture, go ahead and turn with me to Philippians chapter two, because what we just sang about is what we're about to read about and what we are about to study about as we celebrate the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. And so as you're making your way to Philippians chapter two, again, happy Easter. Also wanna let you know, as you heard at the beginning today, we're kicking off a brand new eight week series that we are calling Vintage Values, being Easter people in a Good Friday world. Now, as we think about that title and that phrase, Easter people, that simply means that, that we understand which side of the resurrection that we live on, that, that we understand that Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead. That's why we're here. So we understand that he's alive and well, that Jesus is at work. We also understand that one day Jesus Christ is going to return. And, and so we know that. We also know as believers that as Easter people, that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. We also know that it makes us heirs to the kingdom of God. And it makes us a people that longs for the return of Jesus and to be a part of the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth that he has promised we get to be a part of. The problem, however, is that we Easter people, we are currently living in a Good Friday world, are we not? 
that we live in a Good Friday world that's full of pain and heartache, suffering, injustices, and, and a thousand other things in this world that are not the way we know they should be. That even though we are here, this world, it is not our home. And so for the next eight weeks, we want to talk about some of the old school values that we need to either start incorporating or we need to keep incorporating into our lives, marriages, and families until Jesus Christ comes again. We're Easter people, but we live in a Good Friday world, and, and so we need to, to understand that the resurrection of Jesus is something that happened, yeah, a long time ago, but it has relevance into our day-to-day -day life, and, and more than just being one Sunday out of the year, the resurrection of Jesus should affect our everyday life and all of our relationships. So again, that's why for the next eight weeks, we're going to talk about some of these old school values, values like togetherness and personal responsibility, trusting God and showing grace, living in freedom and finding our significance and our identity in Christ, that, that those are just a few of the topics that we're going to cover as we talk about how Easter and the resurrection should be affecting our lives and our families on a day-to-day -day basis. And today, we're going to kick it all off by talking about how we all, with God's help, can make this transition from selfishness to sacrifice within our families and within all the other relationships in our lives. Now, as we think about families today and being a part of a family, like you're here because you came from a family. And, and, and do you remember as a kid growing up, do you remember playing pretend as a child like I do? Like I'm 51 years old and I vividly remember to this day running around in my backyard pretending to be like my favorite sports heroes growing up. I, I'd run around in the backyard on my dirt basketball court pretending to be Larry Bird, that great guard for the, or forward for the Boston Celtics. And I'd, I'd dribble around in the backyard, man, counting down the clock, three, two, one, there's the shot. Eh. If the ball went in, then I was the hero and the game was over. If I missed, then it was only halftime and I had a chance to redeem myself later on in the game. On the baseball diamond, I was Dale Murphy, that great center fielder for the Atlanta Braves years ago. I had a Dale Murphy jersey and his baseball card. I had a, uh, when I got into the batter's box, I did the same little routine with my bat that Dale Murphy did because after all, if it was good enough for Dale Murphy, it was good enough for me and and even the glove that I used in Little League and high school and on into college, man, you guessed it, it was a Dale Murphy Signature Series glove. Like whether we knew it at the time, we all learned a lot by imitating the people that we looked up to, do we not? Maybe it was a family member, a friend, a teacher, a coach, a neighbor, just somebody else significant in our life that, that we looked up to. We may not have realized it at the time, but, but we learned a lot by imitating the people that God had put in our lives. And, and believe it or not, we see the importance of imitating others even within the pages of the Scripture. I said, Pastor David, where do we see that? Well, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, when the Apostle Paul, he's talking to a group of young believers there in the city of Corinth, and, and he looks at them, and he literally tells them to their face, hey, you follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And what is a clear sign that who we imitate and, and who we follow in life matters, Paul looked at this group of young believers and said, look, I'm living not for my sake, but for your sake. I'm living life not for me, but for you. And if you'll just follow me, Paul said, I'll promise you, I will lead you to Jesus and you will end up knowing and looking more like him. Isn't that an awesome statement to make? Like you follow me and I'll lead you to Christ. You follow me as I follow the example of Christ. So here's the Apostle Paul making that statement. And if you're wondering today, like, like where did Paul get that mindset or that theology to, to put others above his own? If you're wondering where Paul got the mindset or the theology to live not for himself, but for other people, then, then all we have to do is look at the person of Jesus Christ. Because in Philippians chapter 2, as the Apostle Paul is talking to a group of believers and as he's trying to help them understand the importance of living not for themselves, but for others, to put the needs above others above our own. 
as he's trying to get them to understand this concept of living a selfless and sacrificial life, it's almost like Paul stops in the middle of his sermon and he's like, man, I really need an illustration to drive this point home. I really need to to give them something to help them grasp the concept that I'm trying to get them to understand. And, And in that moment, it's like Paul says, wait a minute, man, I'll just tell them about Jesus because there's no greater example than him. And what is without question one of the greatest New Testament passages that we find in all of the New Testament. Notice on the screen that the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the only remedy for selfishness is is, is sacrifice. That what the Bible teaches, what the, the Easter story, what the resurrection of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection teaches us is that the only remedy for selfishness is sacrifice. And we know that because of what Paul goes on to write In Philippians 2, starting in verse number one, this is what he says. He says, if, and so there's the disclaimer right at the beginning, if. So Paul says, if you know Jesus, if if, if you love Jesus, if Jesus has impacted your life in any way, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, Paul says, if you have any of that, then make my joy complete. Translation, Paul says, if Jesus has impacted your life in any way, shape, or form, Paul says this, then please do me a favor by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing. So, So do how much? Nothing. Out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, important phrase, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only after your own interests, but also the interest of others. So in Philippians chapter two, remember that Paul is writing not to a social club. He's not writing to a fraternity or a sorority. He's not even writing to a a group of school kids. Instead, he's writing to the local church. And to these men and women who claim to know Jesus, who claim to know Jesus, who are, who are battling with this temptation to make life and family and relationships and even ministry in the church all about themselves, Paul looks at them and says, look, man, here's what you need to do if you want to make that transition from selfishness to sacrifice. Notice on the screen, Paul says, you need to learn how to think second that you need to learn how to think second. You need to think of other people first. You need to think of yourself second because that's exactly the example that Jesus has set for us to follow, right? Absolutely. And so right off the bat, Paul says, here's the challenge. Here's the the motivation. Here's the key point right here is just just me. Keep imitating Jesus because that's the example that he has set for you. And so we take that and we apply it to the context of like modern day families that we're all a part of. That means that husbands, it, it means that we love our wife like Christ loved the church and we, we live not for our sake, but for her sake, that we find ways to love and bless and honor our wife. Wives, it means that you do the same for your husbands. Teenagers, it means that you do the same within the context of your own family. And you understand that family is not all about you. There's a bigger part of this thing that you are a part of. It means if you're a single adult that you take advantage and you leverage this unique season in your life and you use the freedom and the resources and, and the flexibility that you have to love and serve and bless people, men here and all over the world. For you senior adults, it means that you do the same, not by coasting to the finish line, but but finishing strong by investing your life into the life of a younger couple who maybe needs a little bit of help. That in essence, we live life not for ourselves, but for the sake of others, for something bigger than ourselves. We think of them first, we think of ourselves second. And can you imagine the, the, how, how, the, the difference that that can make within our, our families and our marriages and our homes if we were a lot less selfish and we became a lot more selfless, which is exactly the example that Jesus has set for us. Like think that may change the the attitude and the atmosphere in your home if if you thought of other people more than you did yourself. Man, I do. And listen, if that would change your attitude within our family, listen, that would in turn change the attitude and the atmosphere of our little corner of the world. And so the challenge today is this. This week, why not give it a try? 
This week, why not follow the example of Jesus and think of others more important than yourself and think of yourself second? Why not follow the example of Jesus and think second? That's how we make Easter and the resurrection relevant to our everyday life, that we remember that he came and he lived and he died and he rose again. He put our need for salvation above his need even for life itself, and we should follow and imitate his example. We think second, because that's what Jesus did. But not only that, notice on the screen that if we're going to be Easter people living in a Good Friday world, if the resurrection is going to impact our life on a day-to-day basis, not only do we need to think second, but, but Paul says we also need to think serving. Listen to what he says in verses five through eight, he says, your, your attitude. Now, your Bible translation may say mindset. It, it could say your thinking. It all means the same thing. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And so the Bible, Paul says, that, hey, man, our worldview and the lens at which we look at life, the worldview and the lens at which we look at relationships and marriage and family and being a part of a family and, and having relationships, that our worldview, our thinking isn't to come from the culture. It isn't to come from social media. It isn't to come to what the, the people around us say it should come from. It's that our attitude, our mindset, our thinking should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing. That is that when Jesus took on skin and bones, he laid aside not his divinity, mind you, he laid aside the rights and the privileges that came with being the son of God. That he willingly emptied himself of those things and and laid aside all the rights and the privileges. And it means that he suffered like we suffer. He felt pain like we felt pain. He he felt betrayal like we feel betrayal. That, That he laid aside all the rights and privileges that came with being the son of God so that we could identify with him and him with us. And notice that he did that by taking the very nature of a servant. To use a modern day analogy that when Jesus left heaven and came into our world, listen, he went from the corner office to the janitor's closet. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what he did. He left the corner office and he took up residence in the janitor's closet and he became a servant. How? By being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on the cross. Isn't that amazing? Think about it, man. In Jesus, God became a man. And in that God-man, Jesus, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And then that God-man, Jesus, man, died this horrific death. Not just a, a death, mind you. He died this horrific death, even death on the cross. In fact, listen to what John Phillips, the great theologian, writes about the death on a cross in his commentary on Philippians 2. He says this, he says, the horrors of death by crucifixion began with stabbing pain when nails were driven through hands and feet and a sickening jolt when the cross was hurled upright and dropped into its socket so that the whole weight of the body tore the stab wounds. Then dizziness, cramps, raging thirst, starvation, and sleeplessness all added to their torments. Gangrene, tetanus, and fever followed, and the heat of the sun and the torment of the flies contributed to their suffering. The unnatural position resulted in cramps, the crushed tendons, throbs, and the arteries swelled. Every movement caused agony, and the anguish gradually increased. For a strong man, death might not come for three days. The physical torture alone was terrible, but there was also the public shame of hanging naked and exposed. For Jesus, there was more. This glorious one was mocked by those he had come to save and nailed to a cross made from the wood that he created. And worst of all, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. And what is the ultimate act of serving and putting the needs of other people above our own or his own. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And and here in verse five, the apostle Paul, his sermon is clear that that is the example that we should follow, that if we're gonna imitate anybody, it ought to be Jesus. And if we're imitating Christ, we need to love and serve other people. 
that just like we as kids often grow up imitating our parents, Paul says those of us who are children of God should grow up imitating our heavenly father. And we do that by loving and serving the people that God has put around us. And listen, make no mistake, that has to start with the people who are closest to us. And that's the context of those within our family and our immediate circle of influence. But sadly, listen, it's our family, it's the people closest to us that, that, that normally get the short end of the stick when it comes to thinking second and, and us thinking serving, right? Men, not all men, but some men who, who refuse to help out around the house because doing things such as laundry or the dishes or cleaning the toilet is, is either beneath them or something that they consider to be a quote unquote woman's job. Teenagers, not all teenagers, but some teenagers who, who think that life and family is all about themselves and their wants and their desires and their schedule and, and their need for transportation here and there and everywhere. Uh, women, not all women, but some women who refuse to follow a budget or a spending plan and they spend money simply to spite their spouse or because they're jealous of, of a friend. And so they spend money with abandon, with an attitude that says, huh, man, I'll show them that instead of being humble and serving and thinking second like Jesus did, we go through life with not even giving a thought to how our prideful and arrogant actions and attitudes are damaging the relationships and the atmosphere and the attitude within our homes. And what we learn from this passage is, is that Jesus came to, to model for us and to, to show us a different and a better way. And so that's why one of your next steps this week is for you to ask your, your family or those closest to you, ask them the question, how can I serve or help you today? And, and then you go about finding a way to actually help them and serve them in that way. Now, is that going to cost you something? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. What I do know is this, that when we follow the example of Jesus and, and we learn to think second and we learn to, to think serving, I mean, I know this, it brings glory and honor to God as we're gonna get to here in just a moment because that's the example that Christ has said for us to follow. And that's always been God's plan for the family that, 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 that husbands and wives, that the relationship between a man and a woman ought to be a picture to the world of what the love of God looks like in action. And as we love and serve people in that way, listen, very few things are as honoring to God and gets the world's attention than when a man and a woman or a family are trying to outlove and outserve one another because they're committed to Jesus above everything and everyone else. Folks, listen, you commit to Jesus and follow his example above everything and everyone else, listen, it'll bring glory and honor to God and listen, other people will notice It'll bring glory to God because, listen, that's been his plan for the beginning, that we submit ourselves to God first and then we submit ourselves to each other second, that it's Christ and his agenda first and then it's other people's uh, life and agenda second and then we come in third in the process and then it brings glory to God and, and other people notice that because, again, very few things gets the world's attention than when you have a family or an individual that's committed to God and doing things his way and following and imitating him and, and not the people that's in the world and the culture around us. Because listen, aren't the, the greatest stories that we hear, aren't, aren't the greatest and most moving stories that we hear, aren't they born, men, from acts of selfless sacrifice? Absolutely. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you heard like a moving story on Dateline or 2020 that, that, that moved you to tears, that motivated you, that inspired you, that was all about somebody who was prideful and arrogant and, and, and narcissistic? Like, like those stories don't move us. Those stories anger us because we think to ourselves, how can the world, could somebody think that way and do that? Man, man, how could they be so selfish? How could they just have just no regard for other people whatsoever? Stories like that don't move us, they anger us. But the stories that move us and motivate us and inspire us, it's those stories of selfless acts of service. Somebody who donates a kidney to a friend or maybe even a stranger because 
They want to give them the chance of having a, a better and a healthier and a longer life. Somebody who runs into a burning building uh, to, to save a complete stranger. Like those are the stories that, that motivate us. Those are the stories that think, man, that is awesome. Imagine what the world would be if that was our mentality. And listen, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. That he came and he lived and he died and he served us in the most selfless and sacrificial way possible by dying, not just, on the, not just a death, but dying on the cross for your sin and mine. And since that's the greatest act of sacrifice the world has ever known, then listen, that's the greatest story that you and I can ever tell. In fact, what Jesus did for us is so great that Paul goes on to write these words. We just sang them in verses 9 through 11. Listen to what he says. He says, therefore, so in light of everything that, that Paul's already covered, in light of everything that we've already talked about, which in this context includes, since we understand which side of the resurrection we live on, which includes the fact that, that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So church, as we get ready to close this message, we need to, to know and understand that the exaltation that, that Paul talks about here in verses nine through 11, that exaltation began with the death of Jesus. Because when Jesus was taken off the cross and he was laid in that borrowed tomb, listen, that was the last thing human hands would ever do to Jesus. From there on out, it was all God. That while men had, had done their worst and had dishonored Jesus, God did his best and God honored him. While, while men, while Jesus was hanging on the cross, gave him names of ridicule and mockery and, and slander, then Jesus, God gave Jesus the name of Lord and the name that is above every name. And, and when they took Jesus off the cross and laid him in that tomb, while man laid him low, God raised him from the dead. And as the Bible says in this passage, exalted him to the highest place in all of the heavens. And listen, one day, as the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. The question is, so what do we do in the meantime? Well, as Easter people who are living in this Good Friday world, what do we do? We do what we can to bring glory and honor to God, just like it says here in this passage. That we do everything we can to, to follow the example of Jesus, to, to imitate the, the, what he has shown us. Again, like kids imitate their parents, as children of God, we imitate our heavenly father, which means that we have to learn to think second and we have to learn to think Serving, And if we can take those two things and incorporate them into our lives and our marriages and our families and our homes and our relationships, listen, there's no telling to what God could do in and through our life. And so today, that's the challenge. To take those two things of thinking second and thinking serving and then begin to sow the seeds of those two things within your life. And listen, man, we can do that, man. We can absolutely do that. The, 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 the path has been laid out for us. The example has been given to us. And here in Philippians 2, that's the crux of what Paul is getting at. As he's trying to get this group of people to, to understand what, is, what does it mean to think second? What does it mean to think serving? As Paul is trying to find just the, the perfect example and illustration to drive his point home, he says, man, I'm just going to tell them about Jesus because there's no greater example than him. That Jesus thought about us first and himself second. That Jesus served us in the greatest and most profound way possible but not just dying, but dying on the cross for our sin. And so today, let's take those two things, sow them into our life, leave here, living our life as one big thank you to God because we understand that on the cross, notice on the screen, Jesus didn't just become sin for us, but he became sin for us so that in him, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen? Folks, that's the only hope we have. 
of heaven and salvation and eternal life. That on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that in and through him, we might become the righteousness of God. How did he do that? He thought second, he thought serving. And that's exactly how Easter and the resurrection can impact our life every day after today if we'll sow those two things in our life. And so notice on the screen, here's your next steps. Number one, this week, as I strive to imitate Jesus, I will daily ask those closest to me, how can I serve, help you today, and then seek to serve and help them in that way. It's a simple question that if we will ask it and follow through with it can begin to change the attitude and the atmosphere of our homes. The second next step is this. Today I'm making a seven-week commitment to attend Temple Baptist Church and to be a part of the Vintage Values series. Today was week one, moving from sacrifice to, to service. Next week, we're gonna talk about moving from isolation to togetherness, and, and we're gonna talk about the, the danger of living in isolation and the importance of living in togetherness and relationships with other people. There's a 75-year study that's been conducted that proves that quality relationships in our life can literally mean life and death. And we're gonna talk about that next Sunday. So you make a, a commitment. We're not asking for the rest of your life. I'm just asking for you to make a seven-week commitment to come back for the remainder of this series as we continue to talk about how Jesus and Easter and the resurrection can impact our day-to-day -day life and not just one day out of the year. And then finally today, I will step forward and talk with someone about what it means to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and how I can commit my life to Christ. We're gonna have folks down front. We're gonna have folks in the wings of the balcony. And today, we wanna encourage you and challenge you to step forward, to have a conversation with somebody who, who genuinely cares about you, about how you can confess Christ as Lord and commit your life to him. But before we do that, I'm gonna ask you to do me a, just a pastoral favor. With heads bowed and eyes closed all around the room, here's what I want you to do. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I just want you to take a hand, left hand, right hand, doesn't matter. You can use one hand, both hands, doesn't matter to me. But I want you to take a hand and I want you to put it on your knee. Just take your hand, put it on your knee. Now here's what I want you to think about. According to the passage we just read, Folks, there's coming a day where the very knee that you're touching is going to bow before a holy and a righteous God. And we sang about it and we read about it and we've talked about it. And the Bible says that one day, the very knee you're touching is gonna to bow before a holy and righteous God and the mouth that you have, it is going to confess that Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. Now, the good news of today is, listen, man, we can confess Christ as Lord now. We can repent of our sin, receive his forgiveness, receive his free gift of eternal life, receive the promised Holy Spirit into our life that enables us to live for him on a day-to-day -day basis until he comes back for us. Man, we can confess him as Lord now and receive the blessing and the benefit of knowing Jesus. But, but listen, you do have the option just to forget it. I'll wait you have the option to, to die without making that confession. But just understand this, one day you will bow, you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But if you wait until that day, that, that, that judgment day that's coming for us all, if you wait till that day to make that confession, you'll confess Christ as Lord, but it won't be for salvation. It will be simply as an acknowledgement and an awareness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came and lived and died to give you an opportunity to be forgiven and to know him that looking back, you rejected. And today, how awesome and loving is our heavenly father that he's given us yet another Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, to remind ourselves that he died not just to death, but death on a cross, a criminal's death. To, to be reminded that on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him 
we might become the righteous of God. Today, God in his love and his mercy and his grace has given us an opportunity to bow and confess him now. And my prayer today, if there's one person here and you've never bowed your heart and your life to Jesus, you've never confessed him as the Lord, the master and the boss and the ruler of your life, there's one person here who's never done that. When we stand, get up out of your seat, make your way down front. If you're in the balcony, make it over to the wings and let us have a conversation with you about what it means to confess Christ as Lord and how you can commit your life to him. Don't miss this moment. We will all bow, we will all confess. God is just giving us a chance to do that now. And we are so blessed and thankful for this moment. So Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. God, you did not leave him in the tomb. God, you raised him up. You exalted him. You gave him the name that is above every name. And God, you exalted him highest in all the heavens. And so today we look to Jesus and we examine our hearts. And today if we know you as Savior, if you've impacted our life in any way, then may we think serving and may we think second. God, if we don't know you today, may today be that day where we make that confession and we say yes to Jesus. For your honor and our benefit, Christ, we commit it to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we stand together, we got folks down front, up in the balcony, just like I said, you come on if you need to talk to somebody. This is that moment. Let's declare our allegiance to Christ today. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. But heights of love sacrifice of Christ, but the story doesn't end there. We're going to sing the rest of the story. You lift up your voice, church. Let's proclaim the risen Lord today.
for being here bright and early at 7.30. I don't know what the remainder of the day looks like. I know this, it could not be possible without you coming to this early service. So thank you for serving in this very practical way. For those who may be leaving here to serve in childcare or whatever, thank you for serving here today. Keep our other two services in prayer. Pray for our staff, volunteers. We've had folks that have been here since about 5.30 this morning. So it's going to be a long day, going to be a great day. But again, thank you for doing your part, for being here at 7.30. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday. Know that you are loved and he is risen. Amen? All right, you have a great day.